Greetings, all you magnificent beings, and welcome to Life Mastery TV, your source for inspiration, empowerment, and fulfillment. My name is David McLeod. I am your Life Mastery coach and author of the delightful and wonderful little book, A Life to Die For. I'm also one of the co-authors of the best-selling series, The Wellness Universe Guide to Complete Self-Care. Today uh, marks episode number 200 from Life Mastery TV. That's a pretty important milestone. And today the topic is sacred boundaries. Now, I think we all want healthy, joyful relationships, especially with our families. But figuring out how to get there can be challenging for us. Many of us struggle with drama and conflict with one or more family members, and we find it difficult to set boundaries and communicate our feelings in a safe and healthy way. Over time, we may end up getting overwhelmed or even stressed out and uh, or resentful, of course. And in some cases, the stress or dis uh, of dysfunctional family relationships can lead to mental and even physical illnesses. So in this episode, Sacred Boundaries, we're all about uh, honoring yourself, your needs, your desires, your preferences, so that you can create deeper and more meaningful connections with other people. It is about recognizing and acknowledging your own sovereignty standing in your power and authentically expressing yourself with courage and confidence. To help me shed some light on this amazing and deep topic, I've invited a women's empowerment coach and mentor to join me. Today's guest is the number one best-selling author of Magnify Your Magnificence, your primary, I'm sorry, your pathway to the life and relationships you truly desire. As a certified connection practice coach, she guides clients through a profound science-based process that helps them overcome specific challenges to arrive at an inner healing state of heart-brain coherence, from which intuitive insights lead them to positive outcomes. So please join me in welcoming the delightful and wise Marisa Ferreira to the program today. Welcome, Marisa. Hello, hello. I'm so happy to be here, David. I've been so looking forward to having this conversation with you. That's great. Yeah. Uh, well, I guess we've we've had various conversations in other contexts, but to have you on this show, that's that's really been something I've been wanting for a while. So I'm really grateful that you're here. And uh, actually, I'm, I'm thrilled to have you here. I, I like the energy that you carry. I like the way you present yourself. I like the kind of message that you share. And uh, I'm kind of excited. I mean, boundaries, relationships, family dynamics, what deeper topic can there be? And I think we have a lot to cover today. So I'm kind of curious, to get started, I'm curious about your journey. I'm supposing that something somewhere along the way happened in your life that made this an important topic for you. Would you mind sharing a little bit about that? Absolutely. I'd, I'd be happy to. Um, yes, I, I did, certainly didn't start out in my first career in, in doing this. However, my background certainly did lead me to here to this place in my life. Um, and basically, like many other people, I grew up in a very dysfunctional family. I experienced a lot of physical and emotional abuse growing up, um, and so did my sisters and my mom, so I witnessed that as well. And because of that, I ended up having a lot of difficulties in my own life with boundaries, with having confidence in speaking my authentic truth because it wasn't a safe thing to do. And so I was really shut down and had very low self-esteem, low self-confidence, and certainly no self-love. So that really impacted my life in many ways. And I decided to become a, a coach and mentor after leaving my other career, which was actually in teaching. And it's interesting because I chose the teaching profession because that was also connected to my childhood because I, I wanted to create an environment for children where they felt really safe and loved, uh, especially if they had home environments like the one that I did. I, I just wished I had that because I didn't have that even in, in the school system because I was, uh, you know, born of an immigrant uh, parents. I was, you know, I looked different. I had a different name. I had darker skin. Uh, you know, I was the only non-Anglo-Saxon in my school. So I was really teased a lot, you know, by other children and even the teachers. I really wasn't um, 
I felt, I, I didn't know as a child that there was, you know, some kind of racism going on with me. I didn't know what that was. I just knew that people didn't treat me the same way. And so I had a very sad and lonely um, upbringing. But when I left my teaching career and I was looking at, you know, how, what did I want to do next and how could I contribute? I realized the journey I had taken through my life because I was no longer that really sad and lonely um, young adult that I, or child that I was, and I had really found ways to really bring joy into my life and to heal my relationships, especially with my father, who was the abuser. And and I just re and I started looking at you know other people in my life, friends and family that were really struggling with their relationships, especially with their significant others or with their parents or adult siblings. And and I thought you know there's so much that I've learned over the years that allowed me to create an incredible life for myself and attract uh, you know an amazing partner where we created such a beautiful relationship and together and I thought why not share this with other people and help them to have the same outcomes if that's something that they desire and so sometimes I say you know I used to work with um, young children in my previous career and now I also help people with their inner child to be able to bring the inner child back out and help heal that inner child so that uh, they can create the relationships and, and the life that, that they really want. And that's why the book is, is really connected to that as well. Right, yeah, that's beautiful. And so you, a couple of things you mentioned, one that really kind of stuck out for me, this idea of dysfunctional family. Mm -hmm. You know, I don't know, I think if we looked up the word dysfunction, or family in a dictionary, we'd probably find they have the same the same definition. It's like, what family isn't dysfunctional, you know, on some level? Mm -hmm. uh, it's a pretty rare thing, I would think. Uh, yeah, I totally agree. And there's just yeah. different levels of dysfunction because some sure. people, but, but you're right, because of the, the dynamics, the family dynamics between siblings, um, I don't know very many people who don't have an issue with at least one family member. Right. I haven't, I don't think I've met anyone that, I mean, some people might say, oh, I had a great childhood, everything's wonderful. But the real test for me is, are you able to be with your family during these, you know, family gatherings and celebrations and, and, and be your authentic self and experience a lot of joy and connection and everything's just really great? If you are, then I think that's wonderful. Um, yeah. And I'm happy, you know, for people that have that. And it is possible. But I, most people, like I said, that I know they dread, you know, family gatherings because that's when all the stuff from the past starts to surface and all the unresolved issues just get really loud. And, yeah, some people get sick at the thought of even going back to a family function. And it doesn't have to be that way. There really are ways that we can heal from our past and, and create the boundaries that really serve us and the people we care about. Yeah, right. Now, before I continue, I just want to acknowledge the people who are here on the live presentation and say thank you so much for joining us today. Um, feel free, if you have comments or questions, to post them in the chat there. We'd love to, to have your input. And if you have some reflection on something that you hear, uh, maybe you resonate with something that one of us is saying, um, your comments and your input are really going to be helpful for us to, to keep proceeding forward. Um, one of the other things that you mentioned, you talked about the fact that, you know, you, you are a brown skinned person and you happen to be in school and you were having some challenges and you didn't really understand what racism was all about. You know, is this something that I have noticed in my life? Uh, I don't think that kids particularly are, are racist. I don't I don't believe that for a minute. I think that what's happening is young kids, as their ego is starting to develop, the ego mind is really, really good at spotting differences. It doesn't focus on similarities. It looks at differences, and that's how it does its pattern matching recognition. So even if you had the same white skin, those people would still be picking on you for some reason if maybe your hair was a different color or, mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. I don't know, you got brown eyes instead of blue eyes or uh, maybe you have a lisp. Uh, they'll find something that's mm -hmm. different from them and they will make fun of that. That's what the ego mind does. It creates mm -hmm. this separation from people. And so what we need to do is we need to teach people from a very young age, I think, to be aware of their ego mind and try and stay connected to their heart. Mm -hmm. That's what we have to do as adults because we know the dangers of the ego mind 
even if we don't necessarily articulate it using those words. Mm -hmm. So that's something that I, I, I've been just getting more and more aware of this as I get older and older, and I'm getting pretty old these days. But, <laughs> but you know, uh, so I don't fit in with the young crowd anymore, you know? Yeah. Uh -huh. So well, I'm I, different from the young people. Right, right. Well, I, I hear what you're saying about the children, and it's absolutely true that we need to teach them to really be able to recognize the difference of when they're coming from their heart and when they're coming from their ego. The challenge with that is that most parents aren't aware of that. So it's hard to teach something we haven't learned ourselves. And so that's why I think right. it's really wonderful when, when adults are now uh, looking at ways that they can connect more deeply with their own heart and find ways to express themselves authentically and from a place of love. Because people, authentic expression, I mean, we can authentically express ourselves and tell somebody they're a jerk. And you can say, well, that's my truth. I'm just expressing my truth, right? right. But uh, what I like to teach is how can we stand in our divine power and communicate authentically from our hearts, right? And create those boundaries. So, Because another thing that people confuse sometimes is they think if we are um, love-centered, that means that we just excuse other people's behavior. Because, right. you know, we're, we're supposed to have empathy and have compassion and understand where they're coming from. And I get that because I did that for so long. I was excusing unloving behavior towards me because I, when I was, you know, got to learn a little bit more about what was going on behind the scenes, I thought, well, you know, they don't know any better. You know, they're doing their best. And I would say all these things. But in the meantime, I'm, I'm you know, continually being hurt and subjected to all of this. And then I realized that, you know, I can have compassion and empathy and still have boundaries and let people know where those boundaries are and communicate it from a loving place, not from, you know, anger and upset, which is normally what happens. People kind of go from one extreme to the other. They're either a people pleaser and don't speak at all because they're afraid of the repercussions of, of speaking their truth, or they're like a, you know, steamroller and they're like this, you know, like you're not going to treat me like this. And you put this, you know, big guard on. We don't have to be at either end. I really believe there's a place where we can, like I said, be grounded in our own energy and, and just communicate lovingly with boundaries <laughs> no you're absolutely right and, and so this this going back to what you said about when you say uh you you say somebody is a jerk well that is very very uh childlike and immature language mm -hmm. when you say when i say to you you're a jerk there's all kinds of deeper truth inside there for me that mm -hmm. i'm not saying Putting you're a jerk out there is a way for me to kind of push you away because I'm feeling some pain or some discomfort mm -hmm. or, um, you know, something is bothering me and I don't want to be vulnerable enough to share that with you. Mm -hmm. That's really what it boils down to. Mm -hmm. I was in a, a men's group and we, we used to talk about that very thing. You know, you have a, an issue with somebody. That's great. Let's clear the air and mm -hmm. find a way to share about the issue. Mm -hmm. And I would facilitate this stuff. And every once in a while, I would ask a man, so what's your judgment of this other man? And he'd say, you're an asshole. And I'd say, okay, well, let's stop there. I said, because that's just an abusive statement about this man. And I don't mm -hmm. think you really believe that's true anyway. Because your idea of an asshole and his idea of an asshole are going to be two different things anyway. Mm -hmm. So tell us the truth. What's really going on inside your heart? Well, you remind me of my father. Mm -hmm. Okay, good. Now we're getting somewhere. Tell us more about how he reminds you of your father. What is it about him that reminds you of your father? And so people would then just kind of slowly go down deeper and deeper into their projection and begin to understand, yeah, this is really all about me. It's nothing about him at all. And mm -hmm. before this is over, the asshole thing is completely gone. These guys are hugging each other in love. Beautiful. That is the beauty of, of connection and really becoming aware of the judgments that you have of other people and being able to express the deeper truth that's underneath that. Instead of saying, you're a jerk, you're an asshole, you're a this or a that or anything else, try saying, I am feeling triggered right now and I'm not sure what's really going on, but I, I need to take a little time to process or whatever. Mm -hmm. uh, and then I'll come back and I'll share with you. Mm -hmm. And I can maybe we can have a heart to heart conversation. I don't want to have this this loud, extreme argument with you. 
Yeah, yeah. No, I hear you because I, I often say, this is when I talk about conflict, that what you'll often hear me say is that triggers and conflict are actually opportunities for us to create those deeper connections. But the only way we can do that is if, like you said, we first take responsibility for whatever has been triggered, which is usually some unhealed wound from the past, right, that's coming to the surface. So we have that opportunity to project that out onto somebody and judge them, like you said, call them a jerk or an asshole or whatever. Or we can take that moment and say, wow, like you said, you know, this 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 is is reminding me of whatever it is. And you might not even know what it is in the moment. And that's why sometimes okay. you just have to take that time to ask yourself, you know, what's what's really coming up for me. And when we're willing to take responsibility for our triggers, for the emotions that rise to the surface and recognize them as a gift and that opportunity to heal whatever it is that's underneath that you like you were saying then we're able to come back with that person and realize that yeah they, they were actually the gift that helped you recognize something within yourself that was not yet healed and that's what leads us to greater peace and joy in our lives and with all our relationships right and so that brings us then to the topic of, of boundaries mm -hmm. really uh I, I'll, i'm going to share a little bit here with you i've i've always had this very, very strange idea that I really had no boundaries. Not in the sense that people would take advantage of me or anything like that, but uh, I, I, would, I guess on a spiritual level, I, I believe I'm unbounded. So that's mm -hmm. kind of one aspect of it. Mm -hmm. And so when I put up a boundary, in some way I'm limiting myself. In some way I'm uh, holding myself back. I'm, I'm encapsulating myself inside this, this bubble. Mm -hmm. And you know, I've done a lot of work on this notion of boundaries. And what I've finally come to realize is that a boundary is really, a, it, it's just a statement of right now. It's not necessarily mm -hmm. going to be true tomorrow. My boundary mm -hmm. might be very different tomorrow. Mm -hmm. And this is something that a lot of people don't realize, that boundaries shift and move and, and change from one moment to another. And the other thing that I, I, I've experienced in, in dealing with other people's boundaries is Often I have no clue what the boundary is until I cross it. Yes. And that's when all of a sudden all hell breaks loose and I discover, oh my God, I, I violated a boundary. I'm, you know, and what do you do then? You know? Yeah. So, well, yeah, we, it's important. Yeah, we, we, it's important for us to communicate our boundaries. But first of all, we need to know what they are. And like you said, they can be different in different circumstances. Uh, and with different people and, and from day to day. And the important thing is to know what your own boundaries are. And some people, like I didn't know what my boundaries were because I was so disconnected from my own needs, desires, and preferences. There was no space for me to have any of that when I was growing up. So as a young adult, if somebody asked me, well, you know, do you prefer this or that? I'd be like, like a deer in headlights. It's like, I don't know. I can't, I'm, yeah, I, I'm like, yeah, I had no idea. And, and that actually scared me. That That's what started me on, on the road, actually, to, to doing some right. inner healing work. Because I realized that I have no sense of, of who I am, what I like, what I don't like. I was so shut down and I didn't want to live my life like that. And so the first step is to really connect with what is it that is important to you with boundaries and, and with your relationship with people. Because your boundaries at home are going to be maybe different than at work. Right. There's there's different issues that can come up, but we know when a boundary has been crossed by how we feel. And that's why it can shift, because I may have a boundary uh, because I still have some unhealed wounds that I need a boundary that's a little bit stronger than maybe later after I've done some healing work. So there's no right or wrong with boundaries. I think it's important for us to recognize that um, it's not about judging our boundaries or somebody else's. Because somebody might say to us, you know, like, you, you know, you, you can't ask for that. You know, that's being selfish. Well, that's their judgment. Then they have a right to their opinion. But in the end, we need to decide what's important for us. And, and the key is to communicate it. So if somebody crosses your boundary and you do know what it is, you can lovingly tell them the truth. Just say, you know, when you communicate to me in this way, that, that doesn't work for me. That's very unloving and it, 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 you know, I have a lot of hurt come up and I recognize that that's my own. And right now I would appreciate if you would communicate to me in a, in a calmer tone, right? And if not, you give the person the option to shift. And if they don't, that's where we take responsibility and decide to end a conversation or sometimes end a relationship until the person is ready. And that's not easy. 
to do. But I think the important thing is to do it again from a place of self-love and love for the other. Because when we demonstrate self-love by creating boundaries, it gives other people in our lives permission to do the same. So you need to be ready for that too, right? Right. Well, we, and I agree with you that it's important. It's important for us, for me, to honor my own boundaries. It's also important for me to honor the boundaries of other people. But here's a here's a thing that I'm noticing. I think it's possible for someone to use boundaries as a weapon or as mm -hmm. a manipulative tool. If you don't honor this boundary, then our relationship is over. I'm going to get a divorce. I'm going to do this. I'm going to do that and all the other things like that. Uh, I mean, that's an extreme example. Mm -hmm. It doesn't have to be that extreme, but I can see where we can use boundaries to manipulate other people to behave the way we want them to behave. Mm -hmm. But the boundary then becomes a weapon. Mm -hmm. And that's what I'm concerned about. How do we, we have to stay in our hearts to begin yes. with. Yes, yes. And, and if we are uh, not in our hearts, but rather up in our heads and we're trying to look for ways to get control of the situation, then we might use that as a tool to, mm -hmm. to give us the power we think we really want. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, I think the important thing, like you said, is to stay in our heart. If we know that our boundary is to honor ourselves, right? If, and if we're coming from love of self and love of the other, then we're not going to be trying to manipulate anybody. And if somebody's trying to manipulate you with a boundary, then you have a choice to make. Like if it is in a relationship and they say, well, this is my boundary, this is what's important to me, either you honor this or we're going to get a divorce you have to ask the question like is your relationship one that you want to work together to find agreements because this is another thing that i'd like to just bring in at this point because i think it's really relevant when we create boundaries especially with a significant other because you're in the same space with them if you're living together or whatever it's important to create agreements around your boundaries communicate Absolutely. what you want your boundaries to be and, and let your partner know, you know, it's important to me that, you know, that when we have a conversation that you speak to me in a loving tone and, and then create agreements around what you can do or say to each other in a loving way if somebody kind of forgets or gets triggered. Because let's face it, even when we're aware of all of this, it doesn't mean we're never going to get triggered again, right? right. Because, yeah. because our, our wounds, we heal them in layers. I mean, I've, I've been working on healing from my past for 40 years and it doesn't mean I'm never triggered it's just that because of the work that I've done when I am triggered it's not as intense I'm not as volatile as I used to be I'm not like you know in anybody's face I'm able to uh, recognize it more and communicate and just say hey you know this is what's going on for me and, and I can apologize if I've you know spoken in an unloving way and take that responsibility but with a partner agreements are critical to be able to share authentically what it is that you want and need in your relationship with one another and then get agreements and not agree to something in order to diffuse a conflict or to make it go away because it doesn't go away if you just right. agree to something to stop the conversation because it's too confronting, it'll just keep coming back in different forms until you really sit down and have that heart to heart. So the real key in the relationship is, are you both committed to wanting that peace and harmony and deep connection with one another? And if so, you have agreements that you can call each other on if you feel like you're being manipulated. Right? Yeah, I, I, I agree with that. And so I got two things to say about agreements. And the first thing is uh, agreements have to be written down. I don't believe that any verbal agreement is worth the paper it's printed on. So if, if because if we just speak the agreements and say, yeah, I can, I can go with that. Well, when there's a violation of the agreement, both of you have a different interpretation of what it was that was said. And so therefore, if it's written down, you can eliminate that confusion right off the bat. The second thing that I will say about an agreement is I believe that every agreement should eliminate to the maximum extent possible any language that could be construed as judgmental. Mm -hmm. And when I say judgmental, I don't mean harsh, you know, negative judgment. I mean language that describes states of being that are going to be interpreted differently by two different people. For example, you talked about you know, speaking lovingly to each other. Well, your idea of speaking lovingly to someone may not be the same as my idea of speaking lovingly to someone. So 
you have to be more clear than that. You can't just put that word lovingly in there and expect that you're going to have a, a, a valid agreement. I think the, the agreements, first of all, you want to have as, as few agreements as possible that will make your relationship work. But as many as you need to ensure that you're covering as, as much mm -hmm. of your relationship as you want. Mm -hmm. So think about what's really the important stuff that we want to talk about. Right. You know? Mm -hmm. and, and also have, I think, agreements around the agreements in terms of when, like you said, they're violated. Because if, if again, if we both people are coming, whether it's a um, partnership or it could be, you know, a relationship with a sibling, an adult parent, it doesn't matter. If, if, if everyone involved in the relationship really, truly wants deep connection, peace and harmony, you can create that with these agreements, like you said. Um, I, I mean, we, we wrote some down, we didn't write them all down when I, you know, with my husband, for example, but it, 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 you can still change the agreements because if you have an agreement and then it's not working, then you can revise it because you don't know until you start living within the agreements that you've created with one another, whether they actually work, right? So you That's can exactly fine tune right. them. So, yeah, and, but I think the, the important thing is if, if you're, if somebody breaks the agreement to recognize that they're doing their best. I don't think if, if they're really committed to that peace and harmony in the relationship, I don't think they're setting out intentionally to break the agreement. It's just we have habits, right? We have habits that we've been living for many, many years. And so making an agreement doesn't mean that starting from that moment, the person's going to show up differently, like immediately. It's just to have that expectation, you're setting yourself up for a lot of pain. No, I, I agree. And, and I think that everyone's number one on the list of agreements should be, we will review these agreements every six months and decide what, which ones we want to keep and which ones we want to change and stuff. And, and I think if you make that agreement up front, that gives everybody some breathing room. Yeah, we can try something for a while. And, mm -hmm. and we can also include in there a paragraph that says, and we can uh, review these agreements anytime we want to. We don't have to wait for this six month period, but we will do it at least twice a year. That's well, kind of a, a very important aspect of it. Yeah, it's interesting, David, because I understand what you're saying, and, and that might work for some people to, to do that. And I think that also is a conversation with the other person, because that might not be what works for them in terms of having it that structured. It, it, it is a, a method, but I know, like, in my situation, for example, I mean, I've been with my current husband for 20 years, and we have an amazing relationship. We've never made it um, an agreement that we're going to review agreements because what our agreement was is that if you ever feel that an agreement we've made in the past is not working and I'm talking about agreements even in terms of who does the cooking who does the laundry who you know we don't have any issues about any of that like I didn't pass relationships right because we've agreed on who's going to be responsible for what however we made it clear that if we ever start to feel any like I don't really feel like I want to do this all the time anymore, or there's not that we're not doing it from love and contribution anymore. There's maybe some resentment coming up or whatever. Then we take responsibility for bringing up a new conversation. So it, it can be at any time. It could be a week after we've created an agreement. It might be two months later. It's whenever, for me, the key is this. We know that there's something not work. Whoops, sorry. <laughs> my hair. Um, I know that something's not working in my life in a relationship with somebody if I feel anything other than peace or love when I'm in their presence. Something's off. And I call that, you know, having something in the space. So now I can either ignore that because I don't want to deal with a potential conflict that might arise, which happens with a lot of people. They think, ah, it's a little thing. You know, you might feel a little thing happened, upset, and it's like, ah, I don't want to make a big deal about it. So they don't say anything, right? But then the next time they're with that person, another little thing, ah, I'm not going to make a big deal about it. And then next thing you know, they don't talk, they're not talking to each other. And you're wondering, right? Or one thing happens and somebody totally blows up and you're like, what was that all about? Well, it wasn't about that little thing. It's about all these other little things that have been going on for who knows how long that you haven't talked about. And so that's another agreement I have with my husband is that if there's any little thing that's off, we take responsibility and talk about it. So there's never anything in our space that's, you know, that that's big. So we don't have these big major blowouts that, that I would have had in past relationships. They just don't happen. 
So I think yeah. it's, you know, but I think what's important is that to create whatever's going to work with you and the other person, and it can be different in every dynamic, right? It has to work for everybody involved and to be committed to communicating until you can reach that place. Does that make sense? It can take some time, and but what it's you're worth talking it. about is is like withholds. Yes. Withholds, yes. appreciations, and another terminology I've heard, paranoias. So a withhold is exactly the scenario you were talking about. Uh, we're we're in a relationship of some kind. You do something that irritates me, but I don't want to make a big deal of it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So rather than bring it up, I just take that and kind of store it in the background mm -hmm. um what i'm actually doing is i'm putting a little brick yes a brick between yes. us mm -hmm. and the next day you might do the same thing or you might do something different and it irritates me in a similar way and i put another brick before you know it we got a whole wall between us mm -hmm. and that's precisely what happens with these withholds and and we avoid speaking about them for fear of creating problems or whatever but, you know, if you could take that first withhold, just imagine if I come up to you and I said, you know, Marisa, I have a, a withhold I'd like to share with you. Are you open to hearing it? Mm -hmm. Now, of course, if you're not open to hearing it, you could say, no, I'm not. And I said, well, I, I really do want to share this with you. Can I can you give me a time when I can come back? Create an agreement mm -hmm. around that mm -hmm. in the moment mm -hmm. about when we can talk about it. So then I come to you and I say, OK, I, I'm, I'm feeling this this energy between us right now because of something that's going on inside me and I just want to share this with you and get it out in the open so I can release it and let it go. And you know, when you did X, you did this or that or the other thing, I had this reaction, my body kind of mm -hmm. tensed up, but I chose not to say anything about it because I didn't want to create any animosity or conflict. Mm -hmm. um, and really what I'm wanting with you is deep connection. So yeah. I'm choosing to share this with you so you're aware of it. I'm not asking you to do anything about it. I'm just letting you know that it triggered this thing in me. And that's all I want. And you mm -hmm. need to say nothing more than well, thank you for sharing. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And you can also ask, do you want a response to this? And I might say, yeah, maybe later. Let's just kind of clear this mm -hmm. space for the moment. And if you want to come back and talk to me about it later, that's good. But I don't think there should be an immediate response necessarily when somebody shares that. In the same way, they, you know, What's one thing that we do in most relationships? We're really good at bringing up the things that make us unhappy. Even though most of the things that, that we live with are kind of neutral or they break, make us happy. Mm -hmm. But we don't talk about those. We only talk about the ones that really upset us. So what I like to do in a relationship is create an agreement with my partner that we will take the time at least once or twice a day to approach each other and share an appreciation, at mm -hmm. least one. Mm -hmm. And it, it could be anything. You know, I really appreciated the, the meal that you made tonight mm -hmm. because it, mm -hmm. it felt like it was just full of love and I just really enjoyed it. And I'm just so grateful that you were mm -hmm. able to do that. Mm -hmm. The person receiving the appreciation must, absolutely must, just stand back, open their heart and say, thank you. That's it. You don't have to respond to it. You don't have to do anything. Just accept the appreciation. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. You know, before you know it, you're going to be appreciating all kinds of things about your partner. Oh, yeah. It's natural for, again, my husband and I do it naturally all the time yeah. because we do it because we are in that space of wanting that deep connection and that relationship. And so it's it's automatic. But gratitude is part of my regular day anyway. Exactly. I start and end every day with gratitude within my meditation practice so to extend it you know throughout the day and it's very spontaneous right when, whenever there's a moment i mean sometimes like I, I have my office here my husband's got his desk on the other side uh, if i open my office door he's on the other side with, without um like a closed office and sometimes i'll just you know my door will be open because i'm working and i'll just go over and, and and holler and you know say i love you you know and just out of the blue like it's just you know or he'll do the same um and that's what can happen when you have nothing in the space like we were talking about the withholds because there's nothing there's no guck right it's very clean it's very clear and again like i said it doesn't mean nothing comes up it's just as it comes up, we deal with things in the moment. And so when you can do that with all your relationships, 
it's incredibly powerful. But if you have a relationship that right now is really challenging, you can't just all of a sudden start acting this way because people aren't going to know what you're doing, right? So, so there are ways to initiate new conversations with somebody. And, and one of the things, uh, the way you worded it is, is beautiful, and it's, it's something I recommend all the time too, is, to, is saying to the person, you know, I've noticed, um, you know, we've, we've, like if it's somebody that you're really challenged with, it could be a, a sibling, it could be a parent, an adult child, it could be anyone. And if you, it's somebody you really want to have a good relationship with, but it's just not happening, to just say to them, you know, my, I, I've just really noticed that whenever we're together, there seems to be a lot of tension and upset. And I really want to have, like you were saying, a deeper connection with you, a, a happier, and more harmonious relationship with you. Is that something that you'd like to have as well? And more often than not, the person's going to say, yeah, I want that too. And just say, well, you know, I have some ideas on how we can create that. Can I share that with you? So you ask the permission and then you can start sharing and say, well, you know, I've learned and you can share what you've learned, you know, through what you've read or if you've had coaching or whatever. And just say, these are some things that I've learned. You want to try it out. You know, the whole thing about agreements and, and see how it works. And, and it, it's just you get the buy in when you ask the permission and when you're coming from love, not from attack. Like you don't say, you know, every time we get together, you're causing so many problems between us that, you know, I'd really like to, to change that, wouldn't you? Like, you don't point the finger, right? You just take the responsibility, but you want that's to create, exactly right. uh, you know, yeah. an environment that's safe, you know, for yourself and for the other person and, and start there. And then, you know, recognize, like we said earlier, that they're not going to change overnight because we need to give each other that, that room to be able to evolve and grow into that new relationship. Yeah. Now, I know that we've been talking a lot about relationship here, but there's an undercurrent that we haven't really been talking about, and that is how boundaries come into all of this. Mm -hmm. I, I can see personally how boundaries are very, very obvious in this whole conversation that we're, we're talking about. But for the benefit of the people watching and listening, I just want to make sure that we, we cover those, those terms. And, mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. well, for example, you know, we've talked a little bit what, but what boundaries are and how they can shift and change and grow and, and diminish and all kinds of weird, fun stuff that we're that we're dealing with. But what do you think uh, is like the number one reason why people have a problem with creating boundaries or honoring boundaries? Well, it's been my experience personally and with the people I work with and talk with that one of the deepest that covers a lot is fear. There's a lot of fear around having boundaries. There's fear of the other person rejecting you, criticizing you, attacking you possibly verbally, um, abandoning you, right? And we're afraid of enhancing, like creating even more conflict and more division and more separation. And so underneath it all, there's a lot of fear, a lot of fear of just really expressing yourself authentically in a way that honors you because we're not taught to do that. We're taught to think about other people first, right? I mean, I, I don't know about you, but I don't know anybody that was really taught, you know, think about yourself first. We're all taught that that is being selfish. And yet, when we don't think about ourselves first, we can't actually really honor another. It's just not possible. It's not as authentic as we think it is, right? right. When we when we mm -hmm. care for others before we care for ourselves. It's not... It's, it's, it's not a selfish act. It's an act, uh, I think you wrote this even in, in the write-up for this talk, is, is it's an act of self-love. And we have to be able to do that with ourselves, love ourselves enough to have those boundaries so that other people can feel safe around us and know they can have boundaries too. Because we, we all struggle with, well, I shouldn't say we all because maybe some people don't, but many people do struggle with boundaries because they're deathly afraid of being alienated or attacked in many cases. Right, right. So, okay, so fear then being the number one number one impediment, if you like, to, to boundaries. But I, I think another, another possible angle here is old habits, old patterns, old mm -hmm. behaviors. Uh, we're used to showing up a certain way. Mm -hmm. Trying to change those can be challenging for people. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. What do you say about that? Yeah, no, I totally agree. Um, our, the family dynamics, you know, how we grew up and the role that we played within a family. If we're not even aware of what that is, it's hard to change. Um, for me, for example, I was the peacekeeper. 
I was the one that, you know, wanted to, you know, make sure everybody was safe and everything, you know, was peaceful. I, I, I even remember, like, I became very uh, tuned in to when my father's energy was starting to escalate. It would normally be around, you know, din dinner table because he wasn't home during the day. He was at work, right? So, he, and so I could feel and sense when he was getting really angry and I was ter afraid. I was actually terrified of him as a child. And so I used to walk around the table, even I think five or six years old, and I would just slowly not to be noticed, take knives off the table just in case he threw one. And not that he ever did, but I had this fear because I knew, I saw him um, uncontrollably angry many times. And so I thought he might, you know, just not even think and just pick it up and, and throw it at whoever he's angry at. And so I was so afraid. So I would just kind of take them off the table and hide them in a drawer and then quietly go back to my seat. Right. So I knew I was the peacekeeper. And so when I learned that about myself, I realized, okay, I've become a people pleaser. I've become a don't say anything. Keep, the, you know, that's going to ruffle anybody's feathers. Just keep the peace. Don't rock the boat. Um, but once I recognized that that was my role, you know, as a child and I carried it with me for many, many years, then I was able to realize, no, I don't, I can still uh, contribute to peace and harmony without compromising myself and allowing people to right. treat me in ways that, that are very hurtful. And so, yeah, I, I totally agree. Our, our dynamics are, play a huge part. Our patterns are negative patterns that we just fall into, but we have to be aware of what they are first and then learn some tools and strategies on what we can do differently. Otherwise, right. you're just going to keep doing the same thing, right? Exactly. And these, these dysfunctional dynamics that you've been talking about, I mean, I think we all have them in our families. And mm -hmm. uh, I mean, some of us will try to be the people pleaser. Some mm -hmm. of us will try to be the uh, the peacekeeper. Some of us will try to be the, the clown, the class mm -hmm. clown, mm -hmm. keep everybody mm -hmm. laughing because yes. if they're laughing, they can't be angry sort of thing. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. We, we develop these, these techniques and these habits and these uh, behaviors, if you like, that we don't even realize that, that we're doing them as kids. Mm -hmm. And because we're, we're figuring out somehow on a subconscious level that they keep us safe and maybe keep other people safe in the process. And But what happens is they become so ingrained in us mm -hmm. that we carry those same behaviors forward into our lives. Mm -hmm. Now you, you told me that you already, you, you recognize that this pattern of, of, of uh, people pleaser carried on for you for a long time. I had the same thing, believe it or not. Mm -hmm. Although I was a pretty angry people pleaser. <laughs> yeah, well, you can have both, right? Yeah. The, yeah. the more I <laughs> would try to, you know, defer my wants and needs to satisfy other people, the, more, the angrier I got. And it built up over a long period of time mm -hmm. until it finally came out in a very explosive way when I was about 42 years old. Mm -hmm. But it took that long for me. Yeah. Now, my hope yeah. is, you know, with this kind of conversation that we can help people learn how to bypass those problems sooner mm -hmm. so that mm -hmm. they can have great lives starting in their 20s and 30s exactly. and 30s, rather than waiting until they're 50 60 70 right. years old right and, and having said that i totally agree the earlier the better and having said that it doesn't matter how old anybody is it's never That's too right. late um, and I even tell people, you know, it's never too late to heal a relationship, even with someone who's been who's deceased, because, right. you know, people think, well, it's too late. My father died or my mother, my sister, whoever you you had issues with. And and yet you if, if you don't take the time and find ways either through your own um you know, searching online or, or getting support from somebody else. If you don't find ways to heal that relationship, whatever issues you had with them, you will carry them into every other relationship you have. It's just not going to be conscious, right? You're going to unconsciously be projecting stuff onto people around you because of that unhealed relationship. So I think it's really critical to, um, to, to be willing if you want to have a happy, healthy life uh, and, and relationships, we, we need to be willing to do the work. I mean, there's no magic pill. I, I wish I could say, hey, buy, buy this bottle and pop a few pills and you're gonna, all your relationships are going to be beautiful, right? It doesn't work like that, but it's worth the work. It really is. It can be difficult and painful um, during the process. But then what I say is, what's the alternative? Right. At least if you go through this process of healing and learning new tools and strategies for communicating more effectively, more lovingly and all of that, 
if you learn that there's something at the end for you and during the process you're starting to connect more with yourself and with other people and you're experiencing more love and peace and joy so yeah there might be some discomfort and challenges along the way but the alternative is you're never going to get to that peace and joy and healthy relationships because it's not going to just happen it, it doesn't you just don't wake up one day when you've had challenging relationships and all of a sudden they're all better yeah. I don't know if somebody knows a way to make that happen. I'm, I'm all ears, but I haven't, I haven't well, heard of that. How many people want the magic pill or the magic yeah. wand or the, the secret yeah. incantation or whatever that just makes everything you know better? Uh, the truth is those don't exist. Mm -hmm. And in, in any event, even if they did, I think you would find that the, the path through the pain mm -hmm. is actually far better for you than any magic pill that you could ever take. Mm -hmm. um, you know, you talk about pain, and I, I think pain, unfortunately, has a has a bad rap. Pain really isn't as painful as people think it is. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It's kind of like, I mean, I know for me, when I started doing my deep process work and I started imagining what 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 I'm going to do, I'm going to be revealing some of all this darkness that's inside me. I was terrified of the idea because I thought mm -hmm. the moment I expose that. People are just going to hate me. They're going to judge me. They're going to run away. They're going to leave me alone. I'm going to die. You know, this is the story that was mm -hmm, going on mm -hmm, in my head. Mm -hmm. And what I discovered was the exact opposite happened. The moment I started exposing the truth about myself and, and the darkness within and start revealing it and finding ways to heal it, I found people getting closer and closer to me, mm -hmm. not further and further away, mm -hmm. because they knew they had to do, they had similar stuff in their lives. Mm -hmm. And I was in a way giving them permission to do it. Mm -hmm. Now, was it painful? Yeah, in the same way that, uh, you know, going to a dentist mm -hmm. might be painful, even with the Novocaine in your mouth, mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. it's not mm -hmm. painful in the sense that it's hurt hurts, but it's painful in the sense that, wow, this is really uncomfortable. I don't like mm -hmm. having my mouth open all this long, mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It's, it's, it's an unfamiliar territory, if you like. Mm -hmm. But it it's temp temporary, be right? Similar, it might be similar to giving yeah. birth. Right. You know, there's, there's a lot of muscular contraction and all this stuff going on as you're pushing something out of your body. And that's essentially what, what shadow work is, by the way, mm -hmm. is bringing mm -hmm. that darkness out into the open so mm -hmm. that you can finally get it out and, and heal it. Mm -hmm. And so in a sense, I mean, th this is probably as close as I personally will ever get to childbirth. But I think that that might be a reasonable analogy, I guess, in terms of pain. It's not going to kill you, mm -hmm. you know. In fact, and it's probably going to release you from a lot of, of far worse pain if you don't mm -hmm. deal with it. Absolutely. And, and we all, you know, it's, it, I, I heard you say how the story that you created around the whole thing about your fear of, of opening up and releasing all of this. We, we all create our own stories. My story that I made up before I started opening up and, and going into those dark places. I was really afraid that once I opened up that door, I would become a complete basket case, like an emotional uh, mess and end up with like a mental breakdown and be in a psych ward for the rest of my life. I really was terrified of that. I thought, because I thought there's so, I knew there was so much I buried that was very deep and painful from childhood. I thought, I, I don't know if I can handle all that. Right. And that didn't happen. Yeah, I did cry a lot. I, I had to do a lot of that releasing and whatever, but I didn't, I didn't, that didn't happen. You know, my, my worst fear did not happen. And in most cases it doesn't. Right. But we do have these fears that can stop us. But I think, you know, it's like that old saying, you know, face the fear and do it anyway, because there really is freedom on the other side. So much to experience on right. the other side. Well, you know, what's, what's interesting, Marisa, is that, um, even if your darkness has to do with like severe sexual abuse, people are worried that they're going to they're going to uh, be re-traumatized mm -hmm, because mm -hmm. of going back and revisiting that. Mm -hmm. The fact of the matter is, you're not the same person now that mm -hmm. was traumatized years ago. You mm -hmm. have many more skills and capabilities within you now than that you didn't have before, mm -hmm. and you can kind of look at the situation from a from a, a loving uh god-like 
healing perspective mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. rather than just simply going diving in and, and living the, the pain all over again. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. There are ways of doing this. No, yes. I'm not, you know, I, I'm not saying that you should just randomly go and do this. You obviously want to have a skilled practitioner yes. to help you with this. Mm -hmm. But the point of the, I'm trying to make is that even the deepest, darkest, tra most traumatic pain ever mm -hmm. can be healed yes. if you want to bring a, 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 a loving, intentional healing energy to it. Yeah, I, I totally agree. And, and you know, you mentioned that people might feel that they have to relive all that pain, but what they might not recognize is they are reliving that pain every moment of every, of their lives right in now. ways that they're not even aware of. It's impacting their their okay. lives and their relationships in, in many negative ways. So that that pain, any pain we have inside us, it's it's going to express itself whether we like it or not. It's just, so why not do it in a conscious way? where the healing can happen and we can actually That's release right. it and let it go, right? Yeah. So it's not going to continue to follow us for the rest of our lives. That's exactly right. And I think just another point here, the universe is going to keep giving you opportunities mm -hmm. to deal with this and it will escalate those opportunities because if you don't do it, you are actually harming yourself. Mm -hmm. If you don't heal the old wounds you are actually harming yourself even more so the universe just keeps providing you new opportunities and it escalates the energy until eventually you say i can't ignore this any longer <laughs> yes uh, that's what the universe does and it does it with great love mm -hmm. it doesn't mm -hmm. do it to try and make your life miserable mm -hmm. i i totally agree i totally agree yeah it it's hard for people who haven't experienced that to understand the truth of it Mm -hmm. You know, and so I guess that's why we have people like you and me uh, trying to witness on behalf of those people, mm -hmm. you know, to share our experiences so that maybe they will, maybe they'll re resonate with my message. Maybe they'll resonate with yours and who knows. Mm -hmm. Or some, or someone else's. I, yeah, I think right. that that's why I think it's really important for people to share their own life stories and journeys, not from a place of victimhood, but from a place of inspiring and empowering others to recognize that. You know, you and I, we're just normal, everyday people, you know, just like anybody else that's listening. Um, it's not that we have some special powers that allowed us to, to heal from our past. I mean, we all have that opportunity, but we have to be willing to take steps to um, move on to that healing path. And yeah, it can be scary, but you don't have to do it alone. Well, speaking of, of secret powers, I think we all have access to these mm -hmm. secret powers. It's just that... Yeah. Some of us are more aware of that than others. Mm -hmm. And that's just, you know, comes with experience. It comes with practice. It comes with learning. It comes with, you know, all the, the wonderful plethora, the myriad of, of tapestry experiences that the world has to offer. And, uh, you know, we're all going to, 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 to do what we are here to do because we have this, this deep desire to express and experience all of who we are. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So let's talk a little bit about how one person, how any, anybody who's watching this show right now can begin the process of creating a sacred boundary for him or herself. How they can start? Well, I think the most important place to start is to just reflect on the kinds of triggers that you experience in your life and your relationship with other people. Think about the people that push your buttons because they're your biggest teachers. Right. So that's going to give you a clue as to some of the wounds that you have that have not yet been healed. And then you can look at communicating with that person from a loving space. As you were saying before, you know, what comes up for you when you're in communication with them and that you're working on healing that. And then you can ask for an agreement that can support you with that healing. Right. You can say, you know, we'd really, you know, I'd really love your support as I work through this because I know this is my stuff. Again, you're not pointing fingers or blaming anybody. You can just say it would really help me if, you know, when we're together, you, you know, do your best to communicate to me without yelling at me. Because when you yell at me, I find my, you know, I start to shut down or, you know, these things come up from the past and I'm working on healing that. Are you willing to do that? Right. Mm -hmm. Right. But I think starting with, you know, just recognizing what your triggers are and taking responsibility for them and then seeing how you can communicate that. Because 
it, it's hard to create and honor boundaries when you haven't done the healing work. Because even if you say, I want this boundary, what's going to happen is as soon as you communicate the boundary to somebody, if they start attacking you and judging you for it, you're going to fall right back into those patterns that we talked about. Earlier. Yeah, that's very good. I you like that. You want to have the strength, right? <laughs> Excuse me. Yeah, and the other thing I would say is a conscious practice of self-love. Mm -hmm. is, a, is a really good starting point as well. Mm -hmm. If you can just, I don't know, once or twice a day, just stand in front of a mirror and look at yourself and just say, wow, I love you. Mm -hmm. You are an amazing human being. You're an amazing being. I see so much wonderful, beautiful stuff in you. I see all of these gifts that you have that you share with other people. I see this, I see this, I see just kind of enumerate all the beautiful stuff you see in yourself. And from that place, you say, the more I love myself, the more I am able to be clear about what's important to me. And mm -hmm. I can share that with other people. Mm -hmm. And when mm -hmm. I share what's important to me, in a sense, I am kind of giving them what my boundaries are. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And you're honoring yourself. The, mo the more you honor yourself, the easier it is to create and hold your sacred boundaries, knowing mm -hmm. that they may shift. Mm -hmm. They may shift mm -hmm. in the next second. Right. They may shift in another year. It doesn't mm -hmm. matter. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I yeah, I totally agree. And if 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 people have difficulty with um, self love practices, to explore that too, to take a look at what you know, what is it that's in their way that they're not able to say "I love you" to themselves in the mirror. Like what's right. stopping them from, from being able to do that? And again, do do some healing work because there's a lot of power in, in changing perspective, like looking at things from a different perspective, like you said, and and healing from things from the past and changing some of our stories that we made up from the past so that they're more empowering and we can move forward, um, you know, with more, with more of our boundaries in place and being able to honor them. Because like I said, we can say we have boundaries, but the real test is is when you're in the midst of, of any conflict or, or drama, can you still stand there and honor your boundaries? Can you walk away from a situation after you express, you know, if the person's not willing to shift that you're going to leave, right? That's not an easy thing to do. Can you imagine you're at a family gathering and, and somebody, you know, starts yelling at you or whatever, and you stand up and you say, you know, unless you're willing to communicate to me with, without yelling, I'm going to leave. Mm -hmm. But then you have to be ready to do that. But that's taking yep. a stand for yourself, and that's an act of self-love. It's not that's easy. Right. It's something I did once. It's not easy. <laughs> yeah, I know. <laughs> but I had to take care of myself, right? And sometimes, too, another thing I'd like to share that's important, I think, for people to know is sometimes when we're working on um, dealing with some of our triggers, that if there's something really deep and there's a certain person, you know, that, that you're really having difficulty with. Sometimes we need to separate ourselves from that person for a while. It doesn't have to be a, like a, you know, like a divorcing a, a family member. It can be a separation as you do your healing work. And you can, again, communicate to that person, and let them know, you know, I know that our relationship has been challenged and I, I'm recognizing that there's some things within me that get triggered when I'm with you and I want to work on that. And I can't do that if we're still in communication with each other. Uh, that's another right. thing I did because I just kept losing my power. I could not stand in my, I didn't have the strength yet because I hadn't dealt with my emotional pain. So I didn't have the strength to stand in my power when I was with this person. And so I thought, no, I need to not be in communication at all until right. I work through this. And then after, you know, doing that for like three, four months, now our relationship is, is beautiful. Yeah, that's great. That's great. Well, I also want to just mention to everybody that, uh, you know, both, uh, Marisa and I have coaching practices, and you're more than welcome to reach out to either of, either one of us. Uh, Marisa, do you want to put your uh, your website address into the chat there so people can sure. um, get access to that? Just and I that. see a couple of comments there. Doris, uh, thank you very much to both of you. Well, you're most welcome, and thank you for being here. And Guy says, all spoken from experiential wisdom. Thank you. Well, I hope so. I hope it is wise. I appreciate that, Guy. Thank you for commenting. Uh, so you can see Marisa has put her, her website into the chat there. So if you want to connect with her and uh, maybe set up some kind of a coaching program or something, you can do that with her. And you can also go to my website at yourlifemasterycoach.com if you like. 
um, both of us are, are available and willing to help to the maximum extent possible. I, so I would like to, to before, before we go, David, I do want yeah. to mention if people do visit my website, I do have some free gifts there as well. There's a, a coaching, sorry, a Create Healthy Boundaries guide. Yeah. That and can I'll help have people. that link on my website too. Okay, when, perfect. When I post the uh, recording. Yeah. Yeah. So it's a, it's a place to get started anyways. Yeah, that's great. So Marisa, here we are. It's like the top of the hour. I think we've uh, we've covered a lot of great stuff here today. I just want to thank you and appreciate you for being here. Um, is there any final words you'd like to say before I close out? Well, one one way that I love to, to end a conversation is to just to remind people that no matter how you or anyone else is showing up in a relationship, we really are doing the best that we can in that moment with our level of awareness, our conscious consciousness, the tools that we have, it really is the best we can do, even if it doesn't look like it. And when we approach things from that perspective, it makes it a lot easier to have self-compassion and compassion for others. Yeah, I totally agree. Well, thank you for sharing that. And thank you all for watching today's program. Thank you for being here. Remember, you can catch the recordings for this and all other episodes of Life Master TV on my website at coincidentally, lifemasterytv.com. That's life-mastery-tv.com. So I hope you'll head over there and watch some of our other episodes. And also, I, uh, I hope that you will respond to the request for feedback when, when you receive that in your email. Give us a positive review. It helps us to spread the word and, and get more people coming to these shows. And also, it just helps to get people to, to be more aware of the kind of stuff that's going on. And finally, I'm going to ask everyone to please remember what I call the life mastery mantra, something that you can recite for yourself every day. And it goes like this. I gratefully forgive the imperfect being I have been in the past. I gratefully accept the magnificent being I am right now. I gratefully welcome the evolved being I am becoming in each new moment. So until we meet again, my name is David McLeod. I am your Life Mastery Coach, wishing you love, light, and blessings on your continuing journey. See you next time.